Good morning, everybody. Sunday, the 29th of May. Another month come and gone. <laughs> Can you believe it? I mean, the days are just absolutely flying. But it's again nice and a privilege to be with you this morning, to worship with you and to share the word of God with you. Um, yeah, just be blessed this morning as we share together. Our call to worship is taken from Psalm 97. The Lord reigns. Let the earth be glad that the distant shores rejoice. Let those who love the Lord hate evil, for he guards the lives of his faithful ones and delivers them from the hand of the wicked. Light is shed upon the righteous and joy on the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, you who are righteous, and praise his holy name. Amen. Let us pray. Lord and Heavenly Father, as we come to you this morning to worship you, to praise your holy name. We once again just reminded how amazing you are, how incredible you are, how awesome you are, how wonderful, how majestic. Um, yeah, Lord, we've just celebrated the ascension. What an amazing, amazing event in history. Lord, thank you that we can come to you tonight, uh, this morning, and just worship you, honor you, glorify you. We thank you for a new day. We thank you for life in abundance. We thank you for everything that is happening in our lives. The good, the bad, and the ugly, Lord, just thank you for all that is in our lives. Father God, as we worship today, may we also be repentant. May we look to our hearts. May we pour our souls out before you and cry out, Father, forgive me, a sinner. Because when we do, Lord, we know, we know that we are forgiven. We also know, we will hear your words, your sins are forgiven. Lord, we are challenged by the next statement, go and sin no more. And that's a hard one. That's a tough one. But we place it before you. We pray for your Holy Spirit power to guide us and lead us, to help us to res resist evil, to flee from evil and temptation. Um, but Lord, just thank you that we can come to you this morning to learn more, to grow, to strengthen our faith, to learn more about you, to, to focus closer to you and to see what you have for us. And Lord, it's not about us, but about you. Our love for you blesses us. Um, and that's it. So, Lord, may we just bless you this morning as we share together in Jesus' name. Amen. Our reading today is taken from the book of Acts. Still in Acts. And today we go to Acts chapter 16. Sorry, I didn't get my place here. I thought we'd do the same thing. See who gets there first. Acts chapter 16, verses 16 to 34. Acts 16, 16 to 34. Once when they were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had the spirit by which she predicted the future. <laughs> she earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept doing this for many days. Finally, Paul became so troubled that he turned around and said to the spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. When the owners of the slave girl realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us, Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Upon receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. 
At once all the prison doors flew open and everybody's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we are here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. They then spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in the house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately, and he and all his family were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole family. A lovely piece of scripture. May the Lord bless that to us. I must confess that this is one of those passages in the Bible that really speak to me. There's so many aspects and so many things. Maybe it's because of personal experience that I've had, um, but I think mainly because it's so apt in the world today. I mean, a world that is driven by greed. As much as it is driven by grief, um, reeling in loss and destruction, it's just one of those things that sort of almost an analogy of life as we see it today. But I, I think for me, the aspect that sums up this passage best is contained in Mark 8, 34 to 38. That says, then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be a disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words, in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. That picture, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose their soul? That for me is sort of, the crux of this whole message. I mean, we see the slave girl losing her power. We see the owners of the slave girl losing their income. Uh, Paul losing his freedom. There's so much loss. There's so much stuff that is lost in this process of gaining Christ. And it's a tough one. It really is a tough one because it speaks to loss before anything else. It speaks to us losing everything before anything else. I mean, and I think what makes it tough is we know when we read scripture, there are quite a few passages that speak of giving up everything for God. <coughs> Acts 4.32 being one of them. All the believers were in one heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions were their own, but they shared everything they had. Then there's a story of Ananias and Sapphira. Jesus in Mark's gospel telling us to deny ourselves. Then there's the parable of the rich man in Matthew 19, 21, where Jesus says, if you want to be perfect, go, sell your possession, give them to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Just to know a few, I mean, those are scary, scary verses. But in our passage today, Paul and Silas take away the hope of making money, albeit ill-gotten. Like I said, it's rough. But sometimes, but the truth is this, sometimes we need to lose everything to find everything. Sometimes we need to lose the stuff to see the light. Sometimes we need to lose to gain. Sometimes we need to go backwards to go forwards. It's a biblical truth. And I guess it's best explained with scripture. I can't even try and get my head around it. So I'm just going to read a couple of scriptures to you. I love it when sermons contain so much scripture. Philippians 1.21. Paul says, For to me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Philippians 3.7-9. But whoever, 
Whatever gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in Him. Mark 8.35 For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. John 12, 24 to 25. Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, and anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Lastly, Hebrews 11, 24 to 26. Taking us back to Moses, the, the book of the, of, of the heroes. Um, by faith, Moses, when he'd grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. Oh, man, you can't say it better than that. In short, Paul gave it up all and won the greatest prize of all. Loss of earthly treasures leads to spiritual gain. Self-sacrifice is an eternal investment. Life comes from death. I can go on and on. Humility leads to exaltation. Gain through loss is a spiritual paradox. That's the bottom line. Now, <laughs> before, oh man, before we start to get too excited and evacuate the building and switch off the recording, whatever it is, there is a principle. And the principle is not that we go out and have a massive clearance sale. The principle is not that we auction everything off, but we pause and have a look at our priorities. We look at our priorities. That we pause and have a look what takes precedence in our lives. There's nothing wrong with stuff. I promise you, there's nothing wrong with stuff. Planning for retirement, etc., etc. There's nothing wrong with it. The challenge is simply this. Where do we put God in the hierarchy of stuff? Again, allow me to put scripture first. Um, starting with the Ten Commandments. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I am the Lord your God and I am a jealous God. Matthew 22 puts it this way. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. Matthew 6.33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Colossians 3.17. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it for the name, all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Proverbs 3, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding, and in all your ways submit to him, and he will make your path straight. And finally, still in Proverbs 3, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your crops, then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. Vine. Wine. Wine. <laughs> that sounds like I've had a couple of wines. But anyway, the simple principle, the simple paradox is this. Put God first. He is and deserves to be first and foremost in our lives. He's worthy of the number one, the podium position in our lives. That's as simple as what it is. We don't have to throw everything away, throw the baby out with the bath water. There's a principle. The principle is simply this. It doesn't matter what we lose. As long as Christ is in front. As long as Jesus, God our Father, is number one. The rest will be restored. The rest will be done. Everything will be taken care of. Just love God 
put him first. So how do you end a sermon like this? And like I said, it's an amazing passage, and I've probably gone off at a tangent, but that's fine, because that's where God took me. But, I mean, there's so much stuff here. There's the harassment of Paul and Silas, an abused slave girl freed from oppression, her bosses losing their income. Paul and Silas whipped, or as Luke says, severely flogged and thrown into jail, praying and singing of hymns while in stocks, earthquakes, chains falling off, Sounds like amazing grace to me. Fight and jailers, conversions and baptisms, joy, all of which could probably be a sermon all on their own. But overall, they carry an element of loss. And that all of them point to the sovereignty of God, the power of God, and the saving grace of God. All bearing the fruit of new life. All bearing the fruit of new life. All because God was put first. So if you're sitting here today wondering why, whatever, <laughs> wondering why about anything, why this, why that, why whatever, um, just wondering why. Maybe, just maybe, it's time to review your priorities. Maybe it's time to seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. Maybe, maybe, just maybe, it's time to put God first. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, God first is a tough ask. Because we get caught up with our stuff, our possessions, our things, our people, whatever it is. Um, it is hard for us. So, Lord, teach us to put you first. Teach us to surrender all, to give ourselves to you completely. You don't want us to get rid of our stuff and to do, yeah, you might ask us to share it or do it, but, Lord, you don't want us to just give it all up. You want us to look at the priority of stuff in our life. That's all that matters. And Lord, may our priority be you. Father God, we pray this in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for joining us this morning. I pray that you've been truly blessed. Maybe someone didn't want this message to go out. The phone's been ringing and bleeping and all sorts of things. But anyway, there it is. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope that you've been blessed, as I say to you this morning. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, both now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace to love God's world. Amen.